Um, hello everyone and welcome to SAL's first Law School Basics Seminar for 2017. Uh, for, before I introduce the panel, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay respect to elders both past and present. The way today's seminar will work is I'm going to ask the panel some common questions students have about studying at law school, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So if you have any questions that weren't addressed, you'll have the chance to ask the panel directly. I'll now introduce our very distinguished Analysts who we are fortunate enough to have here today. So, firstly, we have Hope Williams. So, Hope is currently in her sixth year of the LLB and undertaking the Honours Program. Her undergraduate degree was Arts, majoring in History. Um, next, we have Professor Barbara McDonald, who teaches undergraduate courses for Torts, Torts and Contracts to Equity and Media Law, as well as postgraduate courses for Advanced Obligations and Remedies and Legal Reasoning and the Common Law System. Next we have Associate Professor Jamie Glister, who is a teacher of Foundations of Law, Introduction to Property and Commercial Law, Equity and Fundamentals of the Law of Trusts at the University of Sydney. And finally we have Lisa Gao, who is a grad at Allen and Overy having completed her Commerce Law degree at Sydney Uni in 2016. So I now put our first question to the panel. Um, start. Um, so how should I make notes in lectures and how can I structure my notes so that they are most useful for assessments? Um, okay, so how to make notes in lectures. First of all, I guess there are a couple of different approaches. One thing I'd recommend is before you go into the lecture, just take five to 10 minutes to look at the unit of study outline. And in your notes document, just have a list of all the cases in legislation. And if it makes reference to the legislation, I also like to paste that legislation into my notes. Literally just having the title of the case saves you so much time and stress in the lecture because when the lecture names the case, you immediately know where you're at in the unit outline, what heading you're under, and I think it just keeps you more on track. Um, in terms of what to actually do during the lecture, uh, I would not follow the approach that a lot of people seem to do, which is just write down everything, like a stream of conscious style mad tagging. Um, it is good in a sense that if you're, if you're not someone who's really good at picking up content quickly and you just want to go back over and read it later, um, I guess, that's something you could do, but it's not a very good use of your time. You're much better to sit back in the lecture, actually listen to what's being said, and take away what you think are the key things and write them down. Like, I think it's ridiculous, like sometimes in lectures, like the lecturer says good morning, and you can hear people like tapping. Like, <laughs> just focus on what you think is actually important and write that down. So yeah, that would be my, um, my starting off. I'll pass it. Well, I think first now I'd probably say in terms of uh, taking notes, I would be putting away your laptops and taking notes by hand because you do have to get used to writing quickly. And you're, until we have um, computers and exams, which the university doesn't have yet, you're going to have to use your handwriting um, in the exam to write quickly. So if you only have time, you're not going to be able to do that quickly and you're going to suffer later. Um, also, I think there's a very different brain way of going on when you're taking things by hand than actually typing. You can you know, quick, you can much more quickly underline, do various things, etc., by hand than you can even if you're the fastest type. So you have more control over your notes when you do it by hand. Um, the second thing, I suppose, is remember that particularly all the compulsory subjects, which is what Jamie and I are, are mainly teaching, these are really big subjects. And we give you a course outline. Sometimes cases are put in the course outline because we may mention them in passing, and so rather than have to search around, give you the citation, give you the full name, spell it, etc., they're just there. But they may not be something that we're going to concentrate on with this particular year, because this particular year we might spend our time on some other case that might be more topical, or we know we can't do everything. So take your guidance from the lectures as to what is important this year, which means that that may be different from what was important two years ago. So it's your notes for this year that's important. In terms of how to structure your notes that are the most useful, are we going to talk later about other notes for revision? Uh, so if we are, I might leave that forward. Or is this the only time we're going to talk about structuring notes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So one 
once you've finished a topic in any subject, I think what you need is a, a decent summary of that topic. But that summary should not be a summary of 20 cases. It should be a summary of the principles. It should be a summary of the principles of law, the issues that arise in that topic, the questions that arise in that topic. Some of those questions can be asked with a black and white answer. There's a yes or a no answer as far as those but of course, lots of the things that we're interested in are the grey areas. The areas where actually, well, we know this is black and white, but what about this? What about that? There won't necessarily be an answer, but there will be different ways of looking at it. And you shouldn't always be looking for the answer. You should be looking for the principles of how they apply. So your summary should be of principles and issues under a topic rather than just case after case after case. Feed the cases in where they fit rather than making them your organising um, principle. You can already tell there might be some different um, advice that comes up here. Um, I uh, agree with Barbara entirely. Don't use computers. Um, I just, uh, we all know we, we stand in the back, watch each other's lectures. Um, you're all on Facebook and stuff like that. You're all checking your email, right? We know that. It's not It's not rude if it doesn't disturb us. We're not personally offended by it. But it's just a temptation. And if you don't have your computer in there, you won't be tempted like that. Um, ideally, leave your iPhone outside as well. And um, if you're going to use computers, then what Hope has um, outlined is probably a, a good and efficient way of doing it. But it would be, I mean, we, we say this, we don't know what this is, but it would be far better off if you did not take computers into the collective theatre and if you just sat and listened. There's a very good argument that says that you shouldn't take any notes in a lecture, you should just sit and listen. Now that's not kind of what's going to happen, and again, we're not naive enough to believe that, but, but certainly we may kind of maintain our ground on that you should really take it by hand, because it will just, there will be less distractions, you will understand, you, you, your brain will be thinking about what are the important points are. I can't write down everything that the lecturer has just said, so what are the important points? That's part of the learning experience. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, on how to structure your notes, um, I, I think the point is there's a, a difference between the notes that you take in a lecture and the notes that you would then revise from. The notes that you take in a lecture are going to be incomplete. There's going to be dot, 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 question mark, didn't hear that, check this case, not sure, got the right, all that kind of stuff. That's all going to be in the notes that you take in a lecture. Obviously, that shouldn't be still there when you come to revise before the exam. Um, so I suppose I would say take 100 notes in a lecture, try and actually get the material in your brain. Uh, but then certainly what Hope suggests in terms of putting together your own personal little mini textbook or detailed notes with the, with the, um, with the statutes in is certainly a good idea before the exam, but I'm just not sure it's the best way of doing it as you're going through uh, the lecture itself. But, you know, however, however it works for you. Uh, Barbara and I are Luddites, we are a different generation on this, and we would prefer it if we didn't have computers in lectures. It's as simple as that, but um, there's a few limits to how far we can go on that. So I do agree to an extent about the fact that computers are a massive distraction in lectures. I think, honestly, if one person around you is on Facebook, it's really hard for you not to get distracted, not to look at what they're doing on their newsfeed, and not to start thinking, well, what's on my newsfeed? So I really encourage all of you in lectures to seriously make a really strong mental effort to just turn off the internet, don't go on Facebook, don't go on whatever Snapchat, put your phone in your bag, seriously, just don't do it. Because if you do go on and you miss something, getting back in takes a long time as well. And what you've missed might be really important and you just have no idea because a lot of the lectures aren't even recorded. As to how to take notes, um, I was one of the culprits who just took down a transcript of what the lecturer said. Obviously within reason, right? I would never type down good morning or any of the jokes they made or any of the non-relevant things they said. But I found it really helped me when it came to exam time to know exactly how the lecturer put a phrase, put a point, or what they said about a particular set of facts within the case. So I took that down. I found that really worked for me and was very helpful in exams. But if you find it's more helpful to just sit and listen, and it might very well be the case, I encourage you to do that. In, sorry, in terms of making your actual notes, I agree with what Hope said. Make sure you have um, an understanding of what's in the unit of study outline. I would even have the headings and subheadings already in your lecture notes. So when you move through, you can just put the relevant dot points or the relevant notes you take into the appropriate headings. 
it'll make your life a lot easier later on when you go back and try and make those lecture notes into study notes. Just ask, and add one thing. If the lecture is any good, which most of us are, the lecturer should have a way of making you pay attention every 20 minutes or so. So the lecturer should, now it might be just pausing, or it might be just stopping it or coming out from behind the lectern or something like that. There'll be a way of the lecturer saying, right, this is really important. This is a bit where you have to stop typing and just listen to me for two minutes. Sometimes I'll simply say those exact words, right? But even if it's not those exact words, the lecturer, if he or she is any good, should have some way of showing you which bits are important, which bits aren't. It's a lot easier for you to pick up on that if you're not tapping, 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 tapping. Right? It's a lot easier for you to pick up on that if you're writing with your hands and actually looking up and rather than just behind the screen. And that's it. Uh, should I read every case or just start cases? Every. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess um, this was already touched on a bit earlier by Barbara. Um, unit outlines, obviously, you know, maybe also, this terminology we should clarify if you're in foundations of law. Unit outlines contain cases, uh, lists of cases. Sometimes they're starred and sometimes they're not. Starred cases could mean one of two things. It might just mean that it's extracted in the case book. Um, on the other hand, it might mean that the lecturer considers that that is, you know, one of the most important cases in the topic. So, say, you know, 60 or 70 percent of cases might be starred. I think it is important to go off. Um, if a case is starred, you, you should definitely read it. Like, you can't not, you can't not read the starred case. If a case isn't starred, you can use your judgment a little bit more. If it's being talked about extensively in the lecture and you get the um, impression that it's a focus for some reason, maybe it's topical, maybe the lecturer is hinting that this might be something that's important for an assignment, problem question, maybe um, it's relevant in some other way. In that case, obviously, obviously read it. Um, it might be the case maybe that you still read an unstarred case, but you might take less detailed notes on it. Maybe it's more of one that you would skim rather than really look at in detail and come back to later if you think it's more important. Um, but obviously law school is about a huge amount of reading and you do need to be selective. You can't read every single page of every single case. And you are better to focus on what is important, but in saying that, don't discount cases just because they're not started. Yes, I think generally non-starred cases are there because they're illustrations of how the key legal principles work. The starred case might be the high court authority if there is one, or the highest authority on a particular principle if there is one. But then that, has, that principle has to be applied by other courts, other judges. And so the non-starred cases might be about how other courts have to deal with that basic principle. So they're, just, they're really just giving you examples of the application of the law and other little issues that have arisen in the cases, which the High Court might one day have to talk about. Um, I mean, common, the common law only develops as parties bring facts to the court. It's not like legislation, which can cover a field. So the cases are the, the essence of the common law. They, they're giving you all the fact situations. And the more cases you read, the more you'll get used to seeing how principles of law work in practice. What's clear, what's not clear, what's undecided. Um, I think there's a, there's a kind of what came first, the textbook or the case question. Um, Barbara mentioned in her answer before that textbooks are, are, are very important to read the textbook. Uh, so trying, or maybe I'm uh, just going to say. But I, I took a slightly different view when I was doing it. I would read the cases first and then try and get the textbook to kind of see how, how things fit together. And um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that there is really no substitute for reading the start of cases from top to bottom. And I don't mean the extract in the case book. I mean reading the case itself. Now, clearly some of them will be 200 pages long and you're trying to get the 30 pages that's relevant to you. That's just one of the skills you have to develop. You have to develop the skill of working out what is important and what is not important. Now, I want to be clear about what I'm not saying. This is not necessary to get 55 or 60 or even 65. It just isn't. Right? The nature of academic law is that if you read the textbook and never open the case, you would be able to pass. Okay? But you're never going to be able to get distinctions or HDs if you don't actually read the cases. There are little Easter eggs in there that examiners examine. Right. So one example in the equity course from last year, we had a, a case called Barclays Bank against Quizclose Investments and there was an extract of the leading judgment in the case book. 
But what we did was we said you have to read the case. And then in the exam, we gave a question that was on a judgment that was not reported in the casebook. It was one of the minor judgments, right? So the casebook gave you the main one, and that's the one that everybody focuses on. But there were two judgments. We told you to go and read the case. If you went and read the case, you probably were in a very good position to get an HD or a D there. Now, that's an example of us being quite kind of bold about it. It's not normally like that. But the point is, you will be in a very good position to show the examiner that you really understand the area. If you can show that examiner something that's from the case that the examiner didn't actually uh, talk about himself or herself in the lecture, that's a really impressive way of showing that you actually understand the area. And it also actually helps you understand the area. Every now and then you'll hear a lecturer say, read this judgment between paragraphs 20 and 55. It's the best textbook you'll ever read on the topic. It's not like there's a massive distinction here between textbooks and, case, uh, and, and cases. The question is, do you understand the law? Now, often, the judge will explain his or her decision in a way that is brilliantly helpful in letting you understand the law. And if you just decide that all you're going to do is read the head notes or read the extracted bits in the case books, you're, you're, you're missing that kind of um, resource. So I know it's a bit of a council of perfection, and I endorse it entirely everything you hope and God said about the unstarred cases. But if it's a starred case from the High Court or maybe 100 years ago from the House of Lords or the Supreme Court of Canada or something like that. If it's, if it's a case of the highest authority and it's starred, read all of it. Don't, not just the bit that's extracted in the case, but read all of it. And that will put you in the best position. I know it's a constant of perfection. Um, I think a lot depends upon the particular subject and what the examiners in that subject expect. So that's something that you can ask them about at the beginning. It's a perfectly valid question to ask your lecturers and your examiners in the particular subject you're doing. Because I can tell you that in talks in first year, which you're doing, if you're JD, you're doing a semester, if you're LD, you're doing the next semester, there is no way you could read in the time you have available all the judgments of all the cases that are starred. That's why we have actually extracted as much as we can in a case book for you to read, and that's what we expect you to read. Literally, you know, you would have to give up every other subject to read all the judgments. You couldn't. I mean, you know, one case, the case has got seven different judgments, and that's only one of the multiple high court cases on top of the last few years. You just couldn't do it. So take your guidance. In some, in some areas, it may be absolutely bad, you know, to say read the whole thing. And, if, and certainly, if a lecturer ever gives you a hint and says, don't just read what's in the I want you, I'm expecting you to go and read the same judgment. Well, you've been given a hint. That's why you turn up to lectures and listen to to get those hints about it. So I think it does vary from course to course. So I can really confirm what Jamie said about the utility of reading a case from start to finish, and just caveat that with what Barbara said about if the, if the course doesn't require you to do it, don't do it. But seriously, reading a case is so valuable. The entire case will basically, it's like a roadmap for what you have to do at law school. The judge will go through what the facts are, summarise every salacious detail about what the parties have done, and then run through very conveniently all the legal history and the summary of principles that are currently settled, whether things are unsettled or not, and then do exactly what you need to do in a problem question exam, which is to then apply all those principles to the facts that they set up. So it's a really useful thing just to read cases. My FedCon lecturer said, you know, you need to get to a point in law school where on a Saturday afternoon you're happy enough just to, I don't know, grab a bottle of wine or maybe just a glass and just read a case from start to finish. And it really is very interesting and you learn so much from doing it. So I can really recommend doing that. I know it's hard in the first year and it's boring and you really want to, but seriously, stick with it because you will learn so much from it. Second thing, more practically going back to whether to read starred cases, unstarred cases, the best thing for you to do in answering that question is to go to the lectures. Because if you go to the lectures, the lecturers will tell you what the relative importance are of the unsigned cases relative to the side cases. Like I've said, if they go through the unsigned cases in a lot of detail, you can start to think, if you've got time, maybe put that unsigned case quite high up on your priority list and read it. If they barely mention it, maybe what's enough, what you got in your lecture notes is enough. Right, so go to your lectures, there's really no substitute for that in determining how to best study for the course. Uh, is it better to use a case book or a textbook? Um, 
Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think partly it depends on which one is recommended. Um, we in Equity recommend a textbook and a casebook, and but, but we don't stick particularly closely to either of those. I, I'm not sure if that can be answered outside the confines of a particular unit of study, to be honest. I would say ideally, probably, um, the combination of reading the cases and an accessible textbook, I think, is probably the ideal. But particularly units of study will recommend casebooks like we do in equity, so I'm not sure if there's any general advice for that. Well, I think sometimes there aren't casebooks in some yeah. subjects, so all you have I mean, I would absolutely emphasise the value of textbooks. Some expert has taken months or years to look at all the principles, distill the principles, give you the key authorities, set up what's absolutely clear, often identify questions that are unclear, and has done it all for you in a very authoritative way. Um, Justice McHugh, uh, formerly of the High Court, judged the Torts Court last year, and he said that his way of approaching a new problem is firstly to find an authoritative textbook. Read the pages of the textbook, note all the key major cases that the textbook um, lists, note other cases, go read those cases, go and see what cases the major cases refer to, and put together what he called a brief of the particular issue that he's looking at. But he always starts by reading an authoritative textbook if he can, because the textbook might tell him about issues which he hadn't even thought of. If you haven't done that survey of the law first before you approach a particular problem, you won't even know there are some issues. Now, by going to lectures, you would be an to the issues that arise in a particular topic. But you might need more explanation. And everything is not online. You will not, I mean, some textbooks are now ebooks, so that's great. But um, subject to that, you can go to journal articles and so on. But unless you go to the authoritative textbook on it, you might really miss some of the key points of a particular um, area of law. But having said that, how do you use them? If your course describes a casebook, then that casebook might itself have a lot of commentary in the equity one, for example. I mean, I know you're in first year, not um, fourth year or second year JD, but beware the equity casebook because it has questions after the cases which are unanswerable. You know, no one will be able to answer them, even the high court judges. They are, and the questions are there because somebody's thought of this really cool question which no one can answer, and they've put them in. So if you only try to do that, you get really lost. So that's why you need to go to a good equity um, textbook if you're struggling with the area and can't make sense of the cases.